If you're suffering from the winter blues, you could do much worse than taking a trip to Jersey. On average, it's the sunniest place in the British Isles. And I say on average because it's looking a little bit grey today. But there is plenty to do, whatever the weather, and I am planning on taking a walk out there. I'll tell you what, it's a good job I brought these. Jersey is the largest of the Channel Islands. It sits in the Bay of St Marlow, 14 miles from France and 90 miles from the south of England. The Met Office say it's the sunniest place in the British Isles, but clearly not today. The island is surrounded by 45 miles of beautiful coastline, boasts 30 beaches and has the third largest tidal range in the world, which means that every 12 hours, Jersey doubles in size. In the southwest corner of the island, the sea retreats a mile and a half, allowing you to follow the tide and explore the seabed without the need of a diving suit. This vast space mimics a lunar landscape, which is why it's known as the moonwalk. Goes out quick, doesn't it? Oh yes, it'll be dropping uh, during third hour by up to three inches a minute. It's like pulling the plug out of your bathtub. Why does Jersey have this incredible tidal range? Imagine the water slopping backwards and forwards at the end of your bathtub. We're at the end of one of those oscillations. And that's why we get these huge tides in this particular area. Yeah. Now, if we were standing where we are right now an hour ago, yes. how much water would be above our heads? It would probably be at least double the height of us now. And of course, if you were right down at the low tide line, at high water, there could be 10 metres of water above us. As a keen diver, it's strange experiencing on foot what I'd normally be exploring with a mask and a tank. Just take a look at this little line in the sand just coming along here and follow it. Stone's been dragged along by the current because the current's so fast. It pulls them along the bottom. That's the power of the water in this area. We've covered some distance. You look up, back up at the houses, no wonder it catches you out. Yes, that's right. And uh, very quickly, you can find you're in quite a remote spot. You can imagine why people can easily get caught out. They're yeah. just not used to coming into this sort of environment. But some islanders have known and utilised this landscape all their lives. Fisherman Bob Tompkins specialises in trot lining, a traditional form of fishing which capitalises on the tidal range. So how does this type of fishing work then, Bob? All right, well, you have, a, you have a strong ground line and roughly every two metres or so we have a hook uh -huh. and then you simply bait the hook and then that bait will just lift out of the sand and it, it will then be moving around in the tide. Um, and what you're hoping, if you have a, a bass or a mullet or whatever swimming along, comes across the bait. So, incredibly um, beautiful, beautiful fish. Yeah, that is right. lovely, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely lovely. gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. This will make a, a nice little lunch anyway. Mm -hmm. But Bob has also caught a fish he wasn't expecting, and it won't be making it onto the dinner table. We've got a, a dogfish down here. It's a member of the shark family. OK. You have to be very careful with these chaps, is that they have a very, very rough skin. In the olden days, they used it as sandpaper. You can see what he did with my hand just there. So, right. I just pop him in the puddle there. Um, he'll be fine until the tide comes in on the, next, on the next flood, and then he'll hopefully have learned his lesson and will have moved away. It must be a lovely feeling for you to come oh, out here yeah, and do this in a way is. that obviously has been going for, yeah. for centuries. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a, a Jersey tradition. This goes back hundreds of years. This is what we are. It makes you, you know, this is what a Jerseyman is. It's, it's, you're surrounded by the sea. You know, this is, this is part of us. As quickly as this landscape reveals itself, the tide turns and the sea reclaims it until the next low tide. Well, I can really see why this is known as the moonwalk. But as mesmerising as this place is, and you feel like you want to stay here for ages, you cannot underestimate the power and the brutality of that ocean. And that is why this tower was put in place about 20 years ago as a last resort and as a lifesaver. But as I'm sure you can see, it's not the water that I'm battling against at the moment. It's the light, and we're losing it pretty quick, so I'm going to get inland.
Well, I've made it back. Night has well and truly fallen, and I'm sure that the tide won't be far behind me. But from one of the most southerly points of the British Isles to the north, Scotland has 90% of the UK's grey seal population, and keeping tracks on them takes time, effort, and wings, as Jules has been finding out. Historically, Jersey's economy was built on agriculture, fishing, and knitwear. Today, the finance and tourism industries have brought prosperity to the island. And all of this newfound wealth has made it an attractive place to live. As a result, over 90,000 people are huddled together on this island that's just nine miles wide by five miles long. With such pressure on the island, it's often difficult for islanders to get a bit of it for themselves. Gardens are at a premium and there aren't any council-run allotments here. But in July, a country garden scheme was set up by the Jersey Royal Agricultural and Horticultural Society. It's aim for islanders to have a space to grow their own. Just over a year ago, this field was used to graze cattle, but now it's been divided up into 62 plots. And even though it's only been up and running since July, they've already been snapped up. The scheme has attracted a wide range of green-fingered folk, eager to get planting, like these six midwives who've clubbed together on one of the plots to discover the benefits for themselves. So has it been everything that you hoped it would be? More. Much more. Um, there's nothing better than putting food on the table that you've grown yourself. Yeah. So that's absolutely fantastic. And just the camaraderie, really. We were up here on Saturday morning taking the dead leaves off the, the sprouts and it was absolutely throwing it down and we were still having such a good time. Matt, can we interest you in some allotment soup? Oh, yes, please. There we this, go. So this is basically the whole allotment in a cup? That's it. <laughs> what, what, what vegetables are in here? We've got marrow, squash, sweet potato, onions, coriander, and some spices, some Thai spices, just to liven it up. Oh, it's delicious. Now, every midwife's allotment should have a gooseberry bush. Elaine, please tell me that you have one. We have. Have you? We have, yes. Where is but it? It's pathetic. It's oh. there. <laughs> It's the only thing that hasn't grown on the allotment. No. Well, do you know what? I don't think many babies are going to be born under that, are they? Mm, no. Kathy, he thinks babies are born under gooseberry bushes. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> I was going to tell him. You need to come with us, Matthew, for a lesson. <laughs> the midwives are enjoying the fruits of their labour. But with some islanders feeling the land is better used for commercial agriculture, they only came about after a struggle. So, with the success of this example, will Jersey's government consider sowing the seeds for the future by allotting more space? Land is quite a valuable commodity in Jersey, with this relatively small island. Yeah. I think the allotments for the island, you know, for the fresh food, social, community, no, even reducing air miles. And let's face it, in Jersey, we've got 4% of our housing stock is about, is flats and masonettes. So a lot of the people don't have gardens or open spaces. And for those people, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. And how much land do you think you can realistically offer to schemes like this? That's a difficult situation. It depends upon what the demand is going to be. There's quite a good land bank which could potentially be used. We don't have to have large fields. I'm sure we're going to have adequate land in Jersey to provide allotments for people. With more space to grow their own, perhaps the islanders will be able to bring back one of Jersey's most quirky traditions. Believe it or not, there was a time when every garden in Jersey would grow cabbages. But not just any old cabbages, giant cabbages that grow ten feet tall. And as they grew, the leaves would be ripped off as animal feed. But then, of course, you're left with a conundrum of what to do with an enormous stem. Well, back in the 1800s, they made walking sticks. These old postcards show just how famed Jersey became for its giant cabbages. But now, Philip and Jacqueline Johnston are the only walking stick makers left on the island. Why has there been such a decline? The growing of cabbages declined as people kept fewer animals at home. They're no longer used for animal food and sadly not much grown anymore. So there's no real demand for them really? No, yeah, unfortunately yeah. not. Well, let's have a look at, uh, at the process then, because that feels pretty wet, actually. Yeah, it is. That's one which we cut in October, so mm -hmm. that's this year's stick, and that's now going to go into the store for drying. How long? About two years. 
to two years it takes all the water out of it becomes much lighter yeah and changes color and looking at the shape of it then you've, you've sort of got a, a natural handle at the top yeah. so do you so, look at each stick and yeah. think how's we it look work? at the stick and if if we can keep the shape on the handle we do do otherwise we'll cut it off or adjust it to suit a wooden handle right and then then you start sanding do you yes uh, Jacqueline, <laughs> right and is I mean, it quite a tough process yes it takes a, a while a few hours to sand to get it really smooth i use the coarse um, sandpaper first and then I go on to the um, finer sandpaper. And then you're varnishing obviously. I'm varnishing. Obviously I mean you, you kind of pride yourselves on, on this traditional technique. What does it feel like for you to, to know that you are sending these sticks out there and being the last manufacturers? Well it's a pity we're the last manufacturer but it's important to keep old crafts going, traditional crafts going. Well, as bizarre as they may be, I do a lot of walking on Country File, so I decided to have a cabbage walking stick for myself. And as far as sticks go, it's pretty good. Jersey was seen as an essential part of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. His plan was to fortify the whole of the west coast of Europe to prevent an Allied invasion. The German army set about fortifying the island with bunkers and observation points and today Jersey's landscape is still dominated by these concrete reminders. But it wasn't just above ground where the Germans built fortifications. Between 1941 and 1944, between five and 6,000 forced and slave labourers were brought over to create a network of tunnels. Now this is just one of 16 tunnel projects started on the island. Originally, it was built to house ammunition, but just before D-Day, it was converted to a hospital in preparation for an Allied invasion. An invasion that never came, as it was decided the Channel Islands were too heavily fortified. But in 1945, the Germans surrendered, and Churchill made this announcement. The ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front and uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed. Today the tunnels serve as a stark reminder of what this island had to contend with 65 years ago. But instead of destroying them, the ever-resourceful islanders have put them to good use. But not in the way you might think. Dave Cowburn has converted this former German bunker into a fish farm. It houses six and a half thousand turbot, ranging from tiny 50 pea-sized fish to four-year-old turbot weighing several pounds. So you, you, you'd recommend fish farming in a German war tunnel then? Sure, but it's got to be done in enclosed areas because of the UV of the sun, with them being bottom living fish mm -hmm. so in here it's ideal is there a chance we can have a, a, a closer look because yeah, we've yeah. got a net here so yeah. let's go fishing there you are look at that what a beautiful fish when they hatch they're normal swimming fish with an eye each side by the time they decide your thumbnail the eye has slid round and they've turned into a flat fish right. and then that's why their mouth they're still sideways. Yeah, yeah. So how much would you get for a fish like that then? That one is worth about £14. That's a beauty, that one. And you often think back to the times, you know, during the war and get a, you know, get a sense of the atmosphere. It must have been hell for yeah. them, you know, because they, they blasted it all out. A few years ago I had a tin miner in and he showed me how they did it. And if you look up here, you can see a groove where oh, they yeah, drilled. Yeah. Yeah blasted it and it all fell down and when you look you can see the steps in the roof where they blasted each section unbelievable but just in front of us here you can see where all those laborers have yeah. put in this kind of yeah. brick line that's lining. actually where the, the war ended well that was they, the day finishing this end that right was the down day tools. Finished, yeah. the english were here and that was it like out you go yeah. wow but this is not the only surprising use the islanders have found for their tunnels.